Good morning, everybody, and welcome to ARU's History Fest. Uh, we've now gone quite far into the week, uh, coming to our final sessions of the week. If you've been to any before, we hope you've enjoyed them all thoroughly, uh, and it's really nice to see some of you returning again for more of our sessions. If you are someone that wants to do a couple more sessions tomorrow, you can still sign up to those uh, just straight after this session, so do have a look into those as well. I'm just going to go over a bit of housekeeping before we start. Luckily, uh, as it's uh, an online event, we don't need to worry about fire drills or anything like that, but there are a couple of things to bear in mind. So one, you won't need to unmute yourself, uh, so don't worry about that. If you would like to ask any questions or if you would like to um, let me know about any tech issues or anything like that, you can message the chat group, okay? Uh, the second thing is you won't need to enable your video screen. Uh, we don't need to see you at all, so don't worry about that either. Um, Today's session is going to be run by Professor Lucy Bland, who I'm going to hand over to now. Um, so take it away, Lucy, and enjoy the session, everyone. Thank you so much. So I'm talking today about the issue of women's suffrage and militancy. And there are three questions that I'm going to address. And the fourth one is a question for you to think about at the end. So first of all, what, what did militant, uh, militancy of the suffragettes refer to? And why did they undertake this activity? And I got you to read, I don't know if you did manage to read, the short article by Fern Riddell about the suffragettes being terrorists, which is a very contentious issue. Is this an appropriate term? And I'm going to talk about that. Um, and did the militancy actually help the campaign or did it alienate people so much that it was a hindrance? And then finally, as I said, um, what do you think about you know, if you had been there at the time? So can we have the next slide, please? Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, I just want to give you a bit of background, first of all. I mean, you may be familiar uh, with this whole history because obviously we had a, the 100 year anniversary um, in 2018 and there was a lot about it, but nevertheless, just to refresh your memories if you, if you can't remember back there. Um, Women suffragists have been trying to get the vote for years and years. The first parliamentary attempt was in 1867 when you had the second reform bill. And John Stuart Mill, who was a Liberal MP, supported women's suffrage. He put this forward and it was rejected. And then bill after bill, from then on, bill after bill became before the House of Commons, but each one fell. And by the end of the, uh, the 19th century, you Asquith in power, he's very opposed, well, by the beginning of the 20th century, very opposed to women's suffrage and they just are getting completely fed up. So what happens in, in 1897, um, there's a big organization formed, you can see in this picture, it's like a kind of umbrella organization called the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies that brings together masses of little organizations all over the country. And that's, uh, they're known as the Constitutionalist Suffragists because they are committed to trying to get women's suffrage without breaking the law. And they're led by Millicent Fawcett, who you might have heard of. In 1903, in Manchester, a new group forms, which is women-only group, uh, the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU. Now that's formed by the Pankhurst family, who you've probably heard of, Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters, Christabel, Sylvia, and Adela, and another uh, couple called the Pethick Lawrences. And um, they quite soon get called the suffragettes to distinguish them from 1905 when they start their militancy. So can we have the next? Okay, that's just a picture of them with Millicent on, on the left and the <coughs> mother and the two of the daughters. Adela is, is not really very active. Okay, so next um, slide. Okay, so why did they undertake militant activities? The thing is, they've been trying for years and years and years and getting nowhere, and they really felt it's about time that they had to really make spectacles of themselves. They had to let people know about this because they felt they were just being sidelined. And they produced all sorts of publicity, including kind of postcards and posters like this, showing that there were all sorts of men who had the vote, who really shouldn't have the vote, men that were as they called lunatics, men who were slave traders, that was the term they used, um, men who were disabled, men who were drunkards, and then there were kind of all these honorable women, mothers, nurses, mayors, doctors, blah, 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 who, who were deprived of the vote. Um, <clears throat> so they felt, you know, that they deserved it, a lot of men didn't, yet they were deprived. Okay, can we have the next slide? 
Thanks. So what was meant by militancy? Well, from the start, the Pankhursts stressed this idea of deeds, not words. They felt that there had been endless writing of letters, petitioning, hugely long petitions were carried to Parliament, etc., all to no avail. So they felt that people are taking no notice, they have to act, they have to make people stand up and notice what's going on. So it really started in 1905 in a very small act in Manchester Free Trade Hall, Christabel Pankhurst and um, a working class suffrage suffragette called Annie Kenny, they stood up, unfurled a banner saying votes for women and they said we want the vote and they were forced out and they were charged with obstruction. And when they came to court, they were offered a fine and they said, no, no, I'm not going to, we're not going to pay the fine. They chose to go to prison because they really wanted, as I said, to make spectacles of themselves for this to be in the news. And this is what happened for all the years up to the First World War, that when women were arrested, they chose on the whole to go to prison. So the militancy really took off from then and there was a lot of window breaking, for instance, uh, women would gather in, um, in central London with their pockets full of um, stones. They'd walk down Oxford Street and at a particular signal, they'd throw stones at shop windows, particularly these big department stores. And in fact, Selfridges, um, who were in favour of women's suffrage, they put up a notice saying, ladies, do not, please do not smash these windows, we support your cause. I mean, I don't know if they nevertheless did smash the windows. They also um, committed arson, which is clearly um, quite controversial. They claimed that they always took great care to make sure that no one would be hurt. Um, so they would do it on empty properties. Um, they they, they uh, firebombed letterboxes, which obviously was very inconvenient for a lot of people. And the government got so worried about it is that they introduced an act in 1908 called the Public Meeting Act. So it was trying to ban meetings. Lucy, sorry to interrupt. Would you mind going back slightly because you cut out there for the past or 20 seconds, that's all. Okay, um, shall I just say about, it says my internet connection is unstable, oh dear. Um, okay, so the 1908 Public Meeting Act, did you hear that bit? Um, this act was introduced by the government because it was so worried about the suffragettes meeting and um, making spectacles of themselves that they, this act said that any public meeting had to notify in advance the government. So, um, if it suffragette meeting, the, um, the government often would try and ban it, but nevertheless the suffragettes would, would go ahead on the whole. Okay, can we have the next? Um... Okay, so I now want to get to this issue of whether or not suffragette militancy can be seen as terrorism. Now, the term terrorism is incredibly emotive especially against civilian political and religious aims. Now the term terrorist and terrorism, these terms originated during the French Revolution of the late 18th century, but they really gained popularity and wider use in Britain in the 1970s during the conflicts of Northern Ireland. So for example, the IRA bombings, um, over in, in Britain were, were named terrorist and more recently of course um, it's a term applied to religious fundamentalist attacks such as that on the Twin Towers in 2001, the so-called 9-11. So it's a very charged term and it usually has the connotation of something that is morally wrong. Um, governments and other groups use the term to kind of denounce those they disagree with. And in the 1980s, when Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister, she called Nelson Mandela a terrorist. He was still in prison. So I think that shows that one person's um, terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. 
Okay, so were the suffragettes terrorists? I would say not. They attacked property, not persons, and certainly not civilians. They explicitly argued against attacks on people. Now, in that article by Fern Riddell, she does mention, I mean, there are one or two mavericks who might have misbehaved, but that was certainly not the policy of the organization. They wanted to become part of the government and the government process. They didn't want to destroy it. Indeed, they saw the vote as enabling women to become responsible citizens. They wanted to take part in, as Emmeline Pankers, not law breakers. And indeed, they continued to use actually quite conventional pressure group tactics as well as militancy, the demonstrations, selling newspapers, selling um, merchandise, they use lots of um, postcards, um, various um, cups and saucers and things they sold in, 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 their, in their particular colours. And many of the WSPU members actually also belong to the NUWSS, so there's kind of crossover. So I think calling them terrorists really undermines their credibility. And I want to argue that they had violence committed against far, far more than they actually committed violence themselves. Or rather, their violence was against property, while they had violence committed against them, their person. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do I mean about violence? No, yet <laughs> violence against the suffragettes. Well, one of the most notorious a whole group of suffragettes. Bill a fighting between the suffragettes and the police. And it was as if a kind of line had been crossed that these often were quite seen as respectable ladies, but once they were milling around in the street, there was this idea that somehow they had gone so far they were no longer respectable and it was no holds bars for the police. And there were um, claims that the police not only many injuries and in fact two deaths. Um, during this period and right up to the war, at least a thousand members of the WSPU uh, SPU were imprisoned and in fact also some male supporters. They couldn't be members of the WSPU but there were male organizations in support of women's organizations. And um, what you get in 1909 is the beginning of hunger striking and force feeding. It started when um, one suffragette who was in prison said she wanted to be treated as a political prisoner. She wasn't given that status and so she said I'm going to hunger strike and then it spread. Um, and it spread to such an extent that you know hundreds and hundreds of women were doing this worried about it, that they introduced an act Move it on. on the mouse's tail, she's drawn back, re-arrested. Hi Lucy, sorry, I think we are going to have to just repeat the last sort of 30 seconds or so because we've lost you almost completely. Hopefully Lucy will be able to join us again in a moment. I think there we go, that's looking a bit better. Um, so Lucy, we'll let you start again um, from about sort of 30 seconds ago, if that's okay. 
Did, I, did you hear about the act? I think that's just about where we lost you. So if you had uh, start from there. Should I repeat great. about the act? Okay. Yes, thanks. Is it okay now? <clears throat> okay, I'm very sorry that the Wi-Fi is not working very well. Just to say that in response to the fact that all is hunger striking and the women often getting incredibly ill, the government was very worried that they have a martyr on their hands, which they clearly didn't want. <clears throat> so they introduced this act, which was known colloquially as the Cat and Mouse Act, which meant that if a woman was getting very ill in prison through hunger striking, she would be allowed out for a short period of time to recover, and then she'd be rearrested. It's like a cat with a mouse, lets it go, jumps on its tail again, and, and draws it back. Okay, could I have the next slide? Can I have the next slide? So I just want to say something about the force feeding. So the force feeding was a terrible form of torture that hundreds of women suffered. And I wanted to just quote briefly um, from a book by Constance Lytton um, about her experiences. Now Constance Lytton was an upper class suffragette. And her brother, who supported women's suffrage, he was actually in the cabinet. And every time she was arrested, they'd let her go because they didn't want the publicity of this well-known woman um, being in prison. And she was so furious about this that she then decided to disguise herself. So she, she put on different clothes. It's very interesting that how you dressed in that period indicated your class, you know. So she put on quite scruffy clothes and, and she said she was Sarah Wharton and that she was a seamstress. So they had no qualms about force feeding her. They never asked if she had any heart complaint, which she did. So I want to just read briefly from this. Um, <clears throat> the medical officer returned with five wardresses and feeding apparatus. He urged me to take the food voluntarily. This is after about five days of, of, um, of, <clears throat> not, of hunger striking. He did not examine my heart nor feel my pulse. I lay down voluntarily on a plank bed. Two of the wardresses took hold of my arms. One held my head, another my feet. Another wardress poured in the food. The doctor leant on my knees. I shut my mouth and clenched my feet, teeth. He offered the, the choice of a wooden or steel gag. He explained elaborately, as he did on most occasions, that the steel gag would hurt and the wooden one would not. And he urged me not to force him to use the steel gag. But I did not speak. He seemed annoyed at my resistance and broke into a temper as he plied my teeth with the steel implement. He found on either side of the back I had false teeth mounted on a bridge, which didn't take out. So you know, it hurt terribly. He dug his instrument down on a sham tooth. I pressed fearfully in my gum. He said if I resisted so much my teeth, he'd have to feed me through the nose. The pain of it was intense. At last I must have given way, for he got the gag between my teeth. Then he proceeded to turn it much more than necessary until my jaw was fastened wide apart, far more than they could do naturally. Then he put down my throat a tube which seemed to me much too wide and something like four feet in length. Irritation of the tube was excessive. I choked the moment it touched my throat until it got down. Then the food was poured in quickly. It made me sick a few seconds after, and, and the action of the sickness made my body and legs double up. But the wardresses instantly pressed back my head and the doctor leaned on my knees. The horror was more than I can describe. I was sick all over the doctor and wardresses, that's a good thing, and it <laughs> seemed a long time before they took the tube out. Uh, as the doctor left, he gave me a slap on the cheek. Um, when the doctor had gone out of the cell, I lay quite helpless. I'd been sick all over my hair, all over the wall, all over my clothes, but the warder said it was too late to get a change of clothes that night. Before long, I heard the sound of force feeding in the next cell. When the ghastly process was over and all was quiet, I tapped on the wall and called out at the top of my voice, which wasn't much, no surrender, and then came the answer back, no surrender. So there's a whole line of them in prison, all being force fed and all saying no surrender. So, I mean, it's enormously brave. Okay, can we have the next slide, please? <clears throat> um, and at the time, their actions weren't necessarily called um, terrorists, but they were called actions of outrage. And I think it was thought particularly outrageous, as I said, that respectable women should behave like this. And they were so concerned about the WSPU that the organization was declared illegal. And Christabel Pankhurst, 
uh, the oldest daughter, who in a sense became in charge, she fled to Paris and sent, um, sent instructions from there. Then you had the following year the famous scene of Emily Wilding Davison throwing herself under the King's horse at Epsom Derby, which I'm sure you all know about. And uh, this was something she did of her own accord. It seems that no one knew that she was going to do this. Um, and she, she apparently, I don't think it was trying to kill herself. She was going to go out and put a long scarf saying votes for women around the horse's neck. But I think she didn't care whether or not she was going to kill herself. She was so committed to what was called the cause. Votes for women called the cause. They thought it was a way to get much more than just a vote. It was a way to transform society, that they would be able to bring in so many different reforms. And the WSPU took up the fact that she died as, um, as a way of being able to say this is a martyr. Um, I think it both alienated some people on the other, on one hand, but for others were quite appalled by this. So the next slide. Um, okay, so the question is, did militancy actually help or hinder the campaign? Well, I mean, it certainly made the issue highly visible. So you have on the, you know, as I said, they made spectacles of themselves. You had women dressing up as Joan of Arc, who would go on procession. Everyone uh, saw this issue. No one could ignore it. No one could not have an opinion on it. Um, obviously, quite a, there were people who felt alienated by the fact of the arson and the window breaking. But I think there were others who really felt it was about time. Um, just the next one, please. Um, I think there were people who really did feel alienated. Um, when Mary Richardson, uh, a suffragette, attacked the Ropeby Venus, this is a, a famous picture um, by Velasquez um, in the National Gallery. She attacked this picture in March 1914. She said, I have tried to destroy the picture of the most beautiful woman in mythological history as a protest against the government destroying Mrs. Pankhurst, who is the most beautiful character in modern history. I'm, <laughs> you might not agree with that, but I think people were, were obviously art lovers were quite appalled. And that, that again was an action she did off her own bat. It wasn't something that WSPU um, did. Um, okay, so should we get to the final slide, which is uh, my question to you. If you, had been alive um, in the early 20th century. And if you were a woman, would you have been a suffragette, do you think? Or if you were a man, would you have at least supported their cause? Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Um, now, as you as you know, we had a couple of tech issues all the way through, so thank you for so, persevering. Sorry. No, 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 it's absolutely fine. Um, and thank you everyone for, for staying with us during that. I did put a little comment in the chat just saying, if there are any points where um, they couldn't hear or they just wanted to something clarified to, to make a note and, and I'll let you know. So if yeah. there is any, we you know, go over again, I'll, I'll yeah. um, But otherwise, with that question on the screen there for you to think about, um, it'd be great to sort of see some of the comments you could put in about this um, and I can pass them over to Lucy. Uh, and the other thing is, if you have any questions yourself uh, that you would like to ask Lucy about what you've just heard, um, it can also be about history at ARU, anything in general really. Um, I can pass them over to Lucy. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about what you might want to ask, to think about the question on the screen, um, and we will try and get a bit of a chat going uh, about this. Okay. I've also thought of a couple of questions that I'd like to ask as well. <laughs> I've got to leave, let my dog in because he keeps... <laughs> okay. just being a bit annoying. That's right. So we've got, got one question uh, from Tom here who said um, the force feeding was awful, which yeah, when what you read out there did sound uh, absolutely horrendous. Um, and he's saying he's not sure he could have dealt with that. He's asked, how did World War One change the image of woman, uh, women in Britain and the aim of the suffragettes? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, it, it did happened at the outset of World War One is both the WSPU and the NUWSS, the two main organizations, they both stopped their actions 
um, and said that they would now support the war. Quite a lot of the individual members didn't agree with that because quite a few of them were pacifists and tried to oppose the war. And Sylvia Pankhurst, for example, um, the daughter I haven't talked much about, she had her own organization. She'd left by that time. And she was very active in the war in helping women, setting up nurseries, etc. Um, so she, she had a very different take on it. But um, both um, Pankhurst, Mrs. Pankhurst, Emily Pankhurst and Christabel became very patriotic, as did Millicent Fawcett. Um, so they actually were used by the government, funnily enough, who have been their arch enemies, particularly when Lloyd George came in 1916, who wasn't so hostile to votes for women as Asquith. They were used to try and get women into war work, and they cooperated, which helped. But also the fact that there were all these women who were working in munitions and the recognition that women could you know, work alongside men or instead of men and do incredibly uh, good work really did change people's views. And so there had been these organizations um, against women's suffrage um, uh, and big organizations and the Times newspaper, um, the Daily Mail had all been opposed to women's suffrage. They started to change their views really in the light of the fact that how women were working during the war. And in um, February 1918, women over 30 with a small property qualification, which qualification I'll come to in a moment, did actually get the vote. I mean, it's slightly ironic because, of course, many of the women who were working in munitions wouldn't have got the vote because they were um, under 30. Um, so that act in, in 1918 gave women over 30 the vote if they or their husband rented or owned a property worth five pounds or more a year. Quite a small property qualification, but of course it excluded women under 30, excluded women who were living in other people's houses, like unmarried women who might live with their parents or with their brothers, and excluded domestic, domestic servants, who, as there were many at that time, who lived with their employers. So, it, it, but it at least was, um, you know, some extension. So it was a sea change. It was very important. I mean, there were, the, the jury is still out really amongst historians about whether the fear of, of the resumption of militancy was another reason why they brought in that act. And why was it only women of 30 and over, whereas it, for, it was 21 for men? Well, I think there was a real fear actually for all political parties that women would outnumber men because there was what was called the woman, the woman's surplus problem. I mean, that, that there were many more women than men in the country at the time, partly because women lived longer, partly because men were dying in war, partly because many men through the late 19th century, uh, well, the whole of the 19th century had gone off to uh, the, the British Empire, many more than women. So there was that concern that the women would then dominate politics. Obviously, it's going to be few of them if it's just over 30. So yes, the, it certainly really did, the war was the turning point. Does that answer? Yeah, I think so, yeah, that's perfect, thank you. Um, had a few questions come in now, so the next Great. one. Um, you mentioned about how activists um, made sure to try and not harm anyone. Um, we've got a question here saying, did anyone in the public die as a result of the suffragettes' actions? No, suffragettes died. No, nobody was died because of a suffragette, but um, several suffragettes died, um, some from the after effects. And for instance, uh, Constance Lytton got very, very ill from all the false feeding, and she died, age, you know, she was, I think, early 50s, she died 22, but, I mean, she, in 1922. So she wasn't immediate, but the, the effects made her terribly ill. And, and then I mentioned other people that died at the um, um, Black Friday, um, event in 1910, but no, nobody died from any action of a suffragette. Thank you very much. Um, another one now uh, from Lucy, uh, who said, thank you very much for the interesting lecture. Um, she would like to know whether the actions of the NUWSS were seen as more noble or more effective at the time. Would women have still got the vote in 1918 or even sooner if only the NUWSS existed? Well, this is a question. <laughs> this is a, a, a question. One of those 
um, what if questions, which no one really knows the answer to. Um, and I to say there's a lot of disagreement amongst historians. The problem with, um, with their actions is that they weren't so visible. So yes, they'd been, you know, they'd been going on and on and they did do um, some kind of actions which were uh, bordering on illegality like um, census boycotting in 1911 or refusing to pay tax because they felt you know, they haven't got the vote why should they pay tax but on the whole they didn't have the same visibility so if the um, WSPU had not existed it's very hard to know if there would have been that level of publicity about the issue that being said what isn't generally known about and it's only recently a book has come out about it is that the NUWS um, in 1913 did this a huge march they call the great pilgrimage when they they walked the, the stretch of of england um getting people on the way advocating votes for women so the, the you know i think there was there was some support but i mean i'm i'm just really can't answer that question but i do think um i mean maybe the nuwss would have thought of different tactics if they hadn't had the fact that WSBU were being so spectacular. I mean, the, certainly the NUWSS did have these great marches as well. One was called the Mud March when they marched in the rain and the mud and, and, and they all wore white and they were very, you know, they, they, they did put themselves out there, but I still think it, it, it I think the, the WSBU, it was a kind of the wake up call that was, was needed, whatever one feels about some of their actions and i mean i i feel ambivalent about the arson really <laughs> speaking of the arson actually we've had a question come in uh, about that which is saying that the actions from some of the members were criminal such as the arson attacks etc um, yeah. did, did those women get rejected from the cause or were they fully supported by the group they were supported by the wspu because it wsp was uh yeah it was prepared even when the women were doing things that hadn't been advocated from the centre. I mean, it's slightly ironic, actually, about the WSB, because on the one hand, it's, it's fighting for democracy for everyone, for women to have the vote. But yet, on the other hand, it argued it had to be run like an army, so no one had a vote in the WSB. It was run by uh, Emmeline Pankhurst and Crispell. And this led to a split in 1907 when a, a small group, Women's Freedom League, which I like to think I would have been the Women's Freedom League. They, they, were, um, they also did some militancy, but they weren't into arson. And they broke off under someone called Charlotte Despard, who was an Irish Sinn Féinor. And they, um, they sort of, they carried on alongside the WSPU, but they, they were much more democratic. So I think there were problems with the organisation. Um, but the argument was that it has to you know, we are taking on such a huge issue, it has to be run like an army. And in fact, they ha were so horrified by the way that they had been attacked by the police that they started to learn, um, is it called jitsu? Um, they know, so, to, 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 so they could actually try and um, defend themselves, that they wouldn't attack people but, but when they were attacked by the police. I mean, a few of them did that. Um, sorry, did that answer the question? I'm now, yeah. What was the no, I think so. I think so. it's an interesting fact about the, the martial arts as well. I didn't know that. Yes, yes. Um, very quickly as well, actually, Sarah's just asked if you know the name of the recent book you just mentioned. Oh, I think your uh, Wi Fi's just stopped there, so I'm going to ask you to repeat it in a second. Okay, it's by Jane Robinson. It's called The Great Pilgrimage. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, one question I had as well, um, just to give everyone else a bit of a time to think of some more questions if they would like to. Um, when uh, male supporters or female supporters were arrested, did they receive different prison sentences based on their gender, or were they, uh, did they receive the same sort of punishment for, for dealing the same crimes, if that makes sense? Yes. Um, well, there were far fewer men arrested than women, but I think they probably did, I mean, really much far, far fewer, but they did receive, I think, the same punishment. Um, I mean, I think there was sort of outrage that men should support this cause, you know, as much as uh, anything. So, no, they weren't favoured. 
but as I said, it's a much, yes, I'm not, I, I haven't, I don't really know enough about the men's support, but yeah. No worries, thank you very much. Um, for Joanna, just there, I think if you look in the comments above, uh, you can see the name of the book that Sarah has posted uh, in there. Uh, if, if that's okay, if you, if you can't see it, just let us know and, and we will mention it again. Um, okay, so we have a few more questions. Oh, she has got it, yeah. Um, were all women welcome to join the cause or were there some limitations uh, to which type of women could join? I think all women were welcome if they were prepared to, yes, yeah, support it. I mean, it, it, it was very funny. Two, two years ago when we had the, the 100th anniversary, there was... Um, this event that was put on in central London when you could go somewhere you had these very uh, obscure instructions about how to find this place it was basically that you were joining the WSPU but the instructions were so difficult to follow because obviously they you know they, they became an illegal organization so I had to go behind something and down some steps anyway I then go into this room and um, I'm given an alias name and, you know, asked, are you prepared to, are you committed to the cause, as we call, are you do this? And then we had to go out into Oxford Circus with our, I mean, <laughs> with our pockets full of stones. Supposedly, we weren't actually going to go and um, break any windows, but it was an enactment, okay? And then we are arrested by a man dressed up as an Edwardian police officer and were taken to a cell, a recreation of a cell. And then I was subjected to a real cross-examination. And I had an alias name and they said, well, we knew my real name and how would my husband feel about it? I mean, it was extraordinary, but I thought it was fantastic. I really loved this enactment. Um, so, I mean, they, they put me through the initial thing about, you know, would I, would I be prepared even to die for the cause. I wasn't sure about wanting to die for the cause, but you know, it, it was quite good. So yeah, I mean, I think you were you were questioned because I mean, I think there might well have been infiltrators who who went in there. Um, so presumably, certainly by um, 1912, when it was declared illegal, they would have been quite careful. But yeah, I think mostly they welcomed all women. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Yeah, I didn't think about the possibility of infiltrators, and that's. Uh, <laughs> probably was a real problem wasn't it um another question from ava uh, she said about the fact you mentioned Sinn Féin um and she knows that the first ever female mp was a member of their party uh, and she thinks she was actually in prison for the cause what did the response look like in ireland uh countess Marchevics, uh, uh i'm pronouncing her re her name wrong um well her sister um was involved in 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 england in the WSBU. I don't think she was. I mean, she was in prison because she was a member of Sinn Féin, but she was also was concerned. And the thing about um, Ireland, um, I think it was quite complicated because there were divisions around nationalism. So the, 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 the women's organisations there were split around whether they were nationalists um, you know, or, you know, Republicans or, or not. So it was a much more complicated issue. But um, Countess, Ma I'm so sorry, I'm not saying her name out right. Um, sorry. Anyway, because she'd married a count. With, I'm getting her name. But um, she wasn't in prison. For, no, she wasn't in prison, as far as I know, for uh, suffrage issues. She was in prison as, as a member of Sinn Féin, but she also refused, and, and you know, acting around that, but she also refused to take her seat in Parliament because Sinn Féin rejected the English Parliament. And of course, then the first woman MP is um, Nancy Astor, who steps into her husband's um, seat in Plymouth in 1919 when he goes to the Lords. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to get some clarity on that as well. And um, sort of moving on with the the idea of you know how the movement looked in other countries and for example Ireland, when say and suffragettes you mentioned moved to Paris, did the movement spread throughout Europe? Um, had it already happened in Europe? How you know was it successful in its publicity throughout the continent? Well, it 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 varied hugely over 
over Europe. So, for instance, France, women didn't get the vote to 1944. And they couldn't actually vote till after the war, 1945. So, um, whereas in Finland, they'd got it much earlier. I say there was a lot of variation. So I don't think in Paris, she was necessarily involved in any organization. I mean, organizations did exist, but um, I, d I'd, sorry, I don't know enough about the, the continental organizations, other than there were, there were links. I mean, for instance, when, um, the, with the outbreak of war, um, the, the, I mentioned that quite a few of the members of both organizations, the WSPU and the NU WSS, were pacifists, and they had links with women, both in the United States, actually, and in Europe, um, and in Holland, they tried to get to meetings in Holland to argue for um, an agreement to try and end the war. They tried very hard to do that. So they had those kind of links, particularly around um, pacifism, but also, yes, around suffrage. But um, I don't think it was, I don't think it was that the women's movement in, in Britain was the impetus. These, these were happening all around um, Europe and elsewhere, but it, you know, at, at different, at different time scales. And it sort of seems extraordinary, I think, on reflection, that why it took so long in France, and even longer in places like Liechtenstein, it was 1984. Switzerland, women didn't get the vote till 1971. I mean, you know, it seems extraordinary. Mm. When you think about what countries had, you know, when did they have democracies? Actually, if women didn't have the vote, they didn't have proper democracies until women got the vote on the same terms as men. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, another question here from Lucy, similar to the Ireland question. Were there demonstrations of support all over the UK, or did women from smaller towns flock We've to gone. Oh, sorry, I'll try again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. Perfect. Oh, I'll start again. Um, so Lucy said, similarly to the Ireland question, were there demonstrations of support all over the UK, or did women from smaller towns flock to cities like London and Manchester if they wanted to take part? I think there were there were demonstrations in smaller towns as well, and and certainly in the north of England, the north of England through the 19th century was really a place of radicalism for women because there was relatively high employment for women in, um, in factories, um, in textile factories in particular, in, in the north of England. And um, they were very organized. They had been tempted to get into unions and whatever. And so they were much more politicized than other parts of the country. So I think Round the north of England, there were quite a lot of uh, smaller groups going on, and also parts of Wales. I mean, it, it, it varies. So yes, I think that probably um, there were all kinds of. It's, it's, it's interesting. Even now, people are finding out, um, doing research, finding out there were little groups in you know this little town, this little town. There's still a lot of work to be done. Although there's a huge amount of scholarship on women's suffrage, there's new stuff being discovered. You know, every day it's fantastic. Possibly yeah, where you live, you know, <laughs> you, could, you could find out about it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, a comment and question here from Abby, who said, "Thank you for the brilliant lecture." Um, do you think the suffragettes would be happy with all the progress we have made, or do you think they would be um, active militant over issues such as the gender pay gap? Yeah, I mean that's a very good question. I think we haven't made huge gains in many ways, have we? There are still so many issues. They really had this idea. I said that they called the vote the cause. They felt that once women had the vote, all sexual oppression of women would go, marriage law would be completely reformed, um, any kind of you know, prostitution would go, men would be forced to change their behavior, pay would be equal, etc., etc. And of course, it's not been like that at all. So I think you're right, that they would still, I don't know about what actions they would, would take, but I mean, I think, um, you know, the Me Too movement, you know, I, I think they would have been very involved in that, that kind of, of movement. Um, and I think, you know, it, it is depressing that really we still have this huge pay gap. We haven't made great gains. And I think they would have thought, it, it wouldn't. They wouldn't be able to believe how how little progress we've made. I mean, we have made progress in in, in certain respects, certainly around 
um, marriage law and, and whatever and, and gay rights. I mean, it's not that they were particularly dressed, addressing issues of gay rights, I'm ashamed to say, but, you know, I'm sorry to say, but, you know, I think, yeah, I think they would have still been very active. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, had a question here from Ava um, who said she's double checked her sources this time <laughs> to make sure she's right before asking, but she said, um, Sylvia Pankhurst did a lot of work advocating for Ethiopia. Uh, yes. What does the relationship that suffragettes had with race look like, and perhaps with class as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, Sylvia Pankhurst, um, after the war, she got very involved in issues. Um, she, she got together with an Italian anarchist. She was against marriage. She didn't marry him, but she had a child with him. Actually, he's only recently died, Richard Pankhurst, her son. Um, and she got involved in, in politics of, of Ethiopia, which, of course, had been uh, colonized by Italy. Um, and so she was aware of race issues. I mean, I think a lot of the suffragettes and suffragists were not at all. And there have been these critiques um, of the really quite shocking race politics or lack of race politics of people of that period. I mean, I think it, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I think we will be judged 100 years hence for all the ways that we've lacked on this score. Um, I think on the one hand, you can look at them and say, yes, they, they had ideas about imperialism and the empire, and many of them really, I mean, someone like Annie Besant, okay, she was someone who'd been involved in the birth control movement. She then became involved in a religious organization uh, around theosophy, and she, but she, you, she had been interested in women's rights. She then got involved in Indian home rule, so she became involved in issues around race. There were a few women, there were a few anti-racist women, um, that were, but, but a lot of them, I think, really didn't question the dominant assumptions around race and about the British Empire, which, you know, is depressing, but that is the, the context of the time. And I think we have to always, that we can criticise them, but we have to understand the context in which they were thinking and living. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, one thing I always sort of wonder, uh, particularly having been a history teacher in the past, do you think that there is enough done uh, in the education system with the curriculum regarding the suffragette movement uh, and votes for women? Or do you think there could be more which would then help uh, current gender equality? Well, I think it, the audience should, t should tell us because I don't know about, I mean, when I was at school, I, I, I knew I was told absolutely nothing. I mean, I now, my daughter's recently left school. She learned a little bit. I mean, I think there is some teaching, possibly not enough. I mean, I'd like to hear from, from the, the, the students here who are listening to this talk about whether they feel there's enough being taught about suffrage. I mean, I, I certainly don't know. Maybe it varies hugely from school to school and who your history teacher is, whether they, you know, they, they, you have, they have the choice, don't they? I mean, they're not, it's not um, compulsory to teach these things, is it? And similarly around race. I mean, I mean are, there, are things really shifting around teaching around gender and race? Perhaps someone could ask them a question to you. <laughs> That's a great idea, actually. Um, I think um, if people wanted to, with the question that was on the slide as well, uh, now we've all warmed up a bit, um, if you wanted to perhaps comment quickly, sort of just saying, you know, if you were a woman in the early 20th century, might you have been a suffragette uh, or at least support their cause? Perhaps just type us in, you know, sort of saying, yes, I would have supported them or I would have been a suffragette. I would have been the first one throwing stones. Um, you know, let us know what you think. Um, and actually, yeah, it would be great to hear about if you think you've received enough of an education about it, whether you feel like uh, you could have been taught more when you were at school. Um, so I'll just give you a minute or two to sort of type out your responses there uh, and I'll feed some of them back to Lucy. Sorry, this is one of those moments where there's an awkward silence for a minute, but it would uh, hopefully be worth it. Uh, Rob, I think I almost certainly would have been amongst the stone throwers. Um, and certainly in terms of my own education, I mean, the, the sort of breadth and depth of Lucy's amazing knowledge is really highlighted to me, I think, kind of lack of my own knowledge there. And it's been really interesting for me to see, you know, as someone who doesn't have a background in history, 
actually how relevant history is for today. And, you know, obviously that's very much the focus of our degree on AI, uh, at AIU. Um, but it's fascinating to see how relevant, you know, some of the modules that we do and specifically what you've been talking about suffragism and around gender, how relevant these issues still are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I mean, we're getting some responses, aren't we? People are saying that they would be suffragettes. That's we are, yeah. Um, and from Abby here as well, actually, who from the is a history teacher, uh, which is great to hear, saying that they do a whole term on widening the franchise. Uh, and a democracy suffrage day uh, which is oh, great. that's great that's fantastic but presumably she has chosen to do that she wouldn't wouldn't have been obliged to do that it's not part of the curriculum she has the choice is that right uh, i think so i think she'll perhaps comment in saying uh saying more about that and while she does that i'll uh, sorry to put pressure on you there abby and um, while she does that i'll uh, read out the next comment which is uh, from rc23 yes 100 percent uh, and I don't feel I know enough about how important these women have been in my current lifestyle. Um, it's been a brilliant lecture. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thanks. I think for myself, it's it's one of those where I would like to say, yes, I would have been a suffragette and yes, I would have been, you know, out there throwing stones. But it's always difficult to think, you know, if you were there, would you would you have done that <laughs> um, or not? But uh, I'd like to think I would. Uh, Abby's just confirmed. It was her head of department's idea, who is a man. Yes, um, so yeah. Oh, we've got a very long response here, so I'm just going to uh, have a look here. So, Lucy, uh, I think the recent film with Mel Streep uh, and Emily Pankhurst helped raise the profile of the suffragettes, uh, and there was a small amount done for the 100th anniversary at my school. I do feel that we ought to be reminded of the struggles that women went through more often, uh, especially when there are elections, local as well as general ones. That's a good point. Um, so many young people, including young women, don't vote or don't take the time to look into political issues, which is highly frustrating uh, as the suffragettes went through so much only for many of us to not now use our vote. Uh, I definitely would have been a suffragette. However, I think I would have initially shied away from militancy um, ooh, lost it, and joined the NUWSS. I think I perhaps would have been similar to that. However, as the years went on, I think the lack of change would have been so frustrating and I would have engaged in militancy and stone throwing. Uh, sorry, uh, Mer Meryl Streep as Emily Pankhurst, not Emily Pankhurst herself. Uh, that perhaps would have changed how enjoyable that film was. Um, so, uh, from Lauren here as well. Uh, I think it would have been frightening at the time. But I would like to think I would have been brave enough. What truly brave and amazing women. Uh, it's been very, very interesting. I've learned a lot. Thanks very much. Well, that's great. I mean, what's so extraordinary is when you read about some of these women, they are often incredibly ordinary women. I mean, ordinary in terms of they've never done any political action before. They've just, you know, they might have not even worked. They might have just been at home. And, and then they suddenly learn about this and they think, right, it is outrageous. You know, why haven't we got that? And then they will do these things that they themselves cannot quite believe, such as throwing stones, then being arrested, then going to prison, then being force fed, you know, amazing brave. And when they came out from prison, and if they'd been, they, they were given little medals from the WSP. You had a, a little, I should have put these up actually, they had a, a medal with a kind of grill that showed they'd been in prison. And then they would have these um, little badges about how long, you know, how many uh, force feeding, how much hunger striking they did. So they could, again, I said it was like an army. They would get these medals for how they had behaved. So that gave them a sense of a pride in what they were doing and a kind of hope that this, made made a real difference you know. but yes the jury's still out about whether all that militancy really did help but i feel it it must have helped you know it must have really shifted made people think that's the thing perfect thank you um we've actually just had as well uh, abby the teacher we spoke about i think their head of department is on in the, in the talk um on, on his wife's computer uh, and he's put I think it is about highlighting key turning points that are relevant to our students today, both male and female. Uh, the suffrage movement unlocks understanding of democracy more, more widely, regardless of sex, gender or class. Uh, and he's thanked you for the talk as well. Thanks. Yes, absolutely. That's great you're doing it at your school. I'm really delighted. Yeah. I don't know how widespread that is, though. You know? I think the anniversary, the 100 year anniversary, probably really did lead to a shift, at least in that year, 
but whether then people then all you know moved on again <laughs> we're like the me too movement last year that's kind of you know now it's black lives matter and it's great but you know the me too movement sort of is now got do people still think about it now you know these things come up and like with suffrage when it's an anniversary that's terrific but then i worry that it all gets forgotten i think politics sometimes can be very fast flowing and uh, constant back and forth but uh, yeah i think like ava's just said the me too movement is not fully gone i think it is still there um yeah. and i think you know like we say sort of things come and go in terms of their uh, relevance um well not relevance sorry that's the wrong word but um appearance in the media and things a uh, question or state comment here from helen um i would like to think that i would be a suffragette in the 20th century uh, i don't feel as though i've learned enough about the movement at school and would have liked to have learned more uh, and she's thanked you for a great lecture as well thanks um i'm just aware of the time so so what i'm going to do is i'm going to start doing that slowly wrapping things up uh, give people a chance if they've got any uh, last minute questions they're desperate to ask and um, to type those away um, but i'll just start saying Thank you very much to Lucy for, for leading that great session. Um, and thank you as well to all of you for coming and attending it. And more importantly, for your great questions at the end uh, and engaging yeah. in the conversation. It's always really great to receive those. Um, if, oh, we have got one, I think, here. Uh, it's very niche, but recently there's been a strong resurrection amongst, oh, okay, Afro-Caribbean musicians literally over the last couple of days. I think that's regarding the, the Me Too movement from, from Ava there. Um, if anybody would like to sign up to our sessions that we've got on tomorrow uh, looking at history at university uh, and also stalin's russia you can still sign up to those before 12 o'clock today um, if uh, you would like to that'd be great but if this is your last session with us thank you very much for attending uh, and we hope you've enjoyed history fest with us uh, and unless anyone else has got anything to say uh, lucy i don't know if you want to say a couple of well, final just words. thank you so much for all your really great questions they're brilliant and do think of about coming to ARU to do history with us because we'd love to have you and 